What gets measured gets improved. Peter Drucker. In our modern world, data is king, collected through experimentation and studies. Understanding and analyzing this new information has never been more imperative for healthcare professionals. Vascular access nurses are continuously challenged to demonstrate their value. By collecting data and creating more efficient processes, we can lead improvements to reduce the waste, defects, and costs associated with central venous catheter occlusions. Please welcome Lee Steer RN as he shares best practices to prevent catheter occlusions along with his team's award-winning approach to elevating the vascular access role. I'm Lee Steer and I'm excited to spend the next 60 minutes with you discussing how we can continue to elevate our role in hospital. Today, we will discuss the CLEAR study, a five-year journey of sustained progress for central venous access device, or CVAD, occlusion management. Just to give you a little bit about my background, a little bit about myself, and why I'm presenting this topic. I have been in IV therapy for close to 16 years. I'm passionate about IV therapy because it affects nearly every patient who is admitted to the hospital and causes patients extreme anxiety. Patients fear being stuck by needles, and this has been proven in surveys by national patient experience experts. Currently, I'm the unit leader of IV therapy services and oversee a team of 23 RN IV experts. I'm a member slash former chair of the HAI committee and current chair of Hartford HealthCare's clinical value team. I have prior experience in critical care, hyperbaric medicine, and have worked in staff nurse positions in inpatient medical units. Currently, working on a randomized controlled study focused on PIV dislodgements. My published research reflected work in the areas of lean IV therapy and reducing false positive blood cultures. A quick note on my disclosures. I am a current employee of Hartford Hospital in Hartford, Connecticut, and I do consulting as well as participate in speakers bureaus for various companies. The title of this session is The CLEAR Study. The CLEAR represents the idea of patency. In this study, we are looking at the management and maintenance of central venous access devices. Our learning objectives are to, one, describe the relationship between catheter occlusions and the overuse of alteplase. Two, to demonstrate the results from a lean CVAD occlusion management program. And three, to share how we have sustained the results of our program for five years. The information that I will share was published in the Journal of Vascular Access in March of 2018, and the article is available for open access at sciencedirect.com. Before we begin, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Hartford Hospital. Hartford Hospital is a very busy 867-bed level one trauma center in the heart of Connecticut, located in the Northeast. Our core values are integrity, we do the right thing, safety, we do the safe thing, caring, we do the kind thing, and excellence, we do the best thing. As you will see during this presentation, the work my team and I have done reflects our support of our hospital's core values. Hartford Hospital was built in 1854. Today, we have over 7,000 employees. 87 ICU beds, over 100,000 ER visits per year, and are the region's only air ambulance service. We transition over 44,000 patients from inpatient care annually. Hartford Hospital is part of Hartford Healthcare System. We are an accountable care organization that manages population health, and we now have seven hospitals, as well as outpatient services, behavioral health centers, rehab, senior living, and home services. Hartford HealthCare has adopted a lean culture to empower continuous improvement in all areas, including IV management. Using the concepts of lean, reducing waste, variability, and defects, my team and I have been able to grow threefold over the past five years. 
At Hartford Hospital, lean methodology is hardwired on every unit to create a culture of continuous quality improvement. For today's discussion, we are going to focus on one of our lean slash Six Sigma processes we use called DMAIC. DMAIC is an acronym that stands for Define, Measure, Analyze, Improve, and Control. Lean slash Six Sigma is essentially a principle that was introduced in manufacturing that promotes excellence in reducing waste, variability, and defects in a given process. We used this process to stay on track on our journey of creating a central line patency bundle designed to improve patient outcomes and economic results. Let's talk about each of these areas. D, it means to define and we use it to define our goals. For example, we determined a goal to reduce our alteplase consumption by 50%. M, to measure. We had to measure our progress towards goals, which is very important. So we first started with a baseline measure for improvement. For example, we were utilizing four doses of alteplase per day with heparin maintenance flushing twice daily. A is to analyze. Analysis is a process of determining the sources and reasons for our high occlusion rates and outplace consumption. Upon defining, measuring, and analyzing the collected data, Hartford Hospital's IV team began our Lean slash Six Sigma Occlusion Management Program. To I, improve patency by implementing interventions such as an algorithm for outplace use and an anti-reflux needleless connector to prevent unintentional blood reflux. C, lastly, stands for control. We have been able to control the process for creating a standard work centralized process for occlusion management. How have we sustained these results? Related to a lean culture, every unit has lean daily huddles that include one, daily recognition, two, daily announcements, three, we review our daily playbook, four, we generate ideas. And five, we review metrics. We have specific metrics around patient satisfaction, quality, and safety. Standard work observations are conducted and reviewed at Huddle to assure we are all on the same page, a process that has allowed us to sustain our results. When we began this journey of creating a central line patency bundle, we had to look at what we had been doing in the past what improvements could be made, and how we would sustain those into the future. We wanted to answer the questions of why weren't CVAD occlusions measured, and how do we get a broader organizational understanding for why this is important. In 2014, the IV team decided to tackle central venous access device occlusions. There was a lot going on at Hartford Hospital during that time. For example, we had been undergoing changes in leadership and overall the IV team was experiencing cuts in staff after a consulting group had recommended it. As many of you have probably experienced in your own institutions, this is disheartening given the important role that vascular access nurses play in patient care we felt we could do a better job of showing the value of our team and decided to tackle central venous access device occlusions as our first big lean project. We knew that central venous access device improvements could yield the full benefits of a lean project in the areas of savings, patient and nurse satisfaction, as well as reduced waste. After a historical or retrospective review of our alteplase usage and CLAPSI rates, we knew our team could make a big impact in this area. Nearly one third of all catheter failures are due to occlusions. We felt this was an accepted but unacceptable problem. Central venous access device occlusions negatively affect clinical outcomes, patient satisfaction, and nurse satisfaction and cost. By eliminating occlusions, we knew we could show a total improvement in care in all three areas. There was the opportunity to decrease out-to-place usage, central line bloodstream infections, 
catheter replacements, treatment delays, and overall supply costs, while at the same time increasing catheter dwell time, nurse efficiency, patient and staff satisfaction, and decreased patient length of stay. Let's take a minute to discuss the types of central venous access device occlusions we studied. Nearly 60% of all occlusions are thrombotic occlusions. Let's take a minute to talk about the differences in thrombotic versus non-thrombotic occlusions. Whenever a catheter occlusion is identified, the clinician's first step should always be to rule out possible mechanical causes. Non-thrombotic mechanical occlusions require looking for internal or external issues. For example, kinks in the catheter or tubing set from clamping, possible clogged filters, constriction from the suture or securement devices. Also, kinks in the catheter could be caused by tissue or vasculature as the catheter passes through subcutaneous tissue slash muscle before entering the vessel, common with pick insertions. Important to check for catheter migration, resulting in the catheter tip being outside optimal tip location where turbulent blood flow is occurring at the SVC slash right atrial junction, a step that may require dressing removal. It's important to make sure was the pick line cut too short Triple lumen catheter SVC abutment is common, especially with left side subclavian slash internal jugular insertion. Also, for mechanical occlusions, checking for pinch off syndrome, which is uncommon, but can occur with the subclavian or IJ approach with tunneled central venous catheters like ports. Many of these possible failures may require radiographic imaging for tip verification. For intra or extra luminal thrombotic occlusions, you will want to evaluate for clot formation. Intraluminal clot formation is caused by blood reflux into the catheter tip due to pressure variations. Let's take a closer look at how that process occurs. As characterized in a publication by Hathaway in 2005, the root cause of catheter occlusions can easily and simply be characterized into two groups, which are mechanical, external, and physiological, internal, pressure changes in a closed IV system. These internal and external pressure fluctuations cause blood to freely move bidirectional or reflux from the patient vasculature into the lumen of the IV catheter. Physiological or internal pressure changes are those pressure sources which occur due to venous pressure changes such as venospasm, venous valve, valves opening and closing, and vein diameter changes with hemodynamic pressure changes. Pressure changes also occur during normal respiratory breathing, muscle flexing, and intrathoracic pressure changes caused by crying, coughing, sneezing, and vomiting. All these physiological processes result in internal pressure changes that can result in unintentional blood reflux. Mechanical or external pressure changes are from those sources such as ventilator pressure changes, connection and disconnection of an IV syringe and IV administration sets, infusion pump fill cycles, tubing set manipulations, fluid container height, ambulation of patient from bed to gurney or bed to wheelchair, syringe manipulation and syringe plunger rebound, empty IV containers, improper clamping sequence. All these mechanical processes cause external pressure changes that also can cause unintentional blood reflux. This unintentional and uncontrolled blood reflux will continuously coat and build up on the inside walls of your patient's IV catheter that will not fully be removed even with the best pulsatile flushing technique. How do internal thrombotic occlusions occur? 
Blood is the first body fluid which comes into contact with vascular access catheter materials, such as urethanes and teflons. When the synthetic catheter material comes into contact with blood, a layer of plasma proteins absorbs onto the catheter surface and triggers a complex series of biological responses, including protein absorption, platelet adhesion, coagulation, and thrombosis. Blood coagulation and platelet adhesion to intraluminal catheter surfaces remain one of the largest contributors to vascular access catheter dysfunction by producing partial and total IV catheter occlusion. Despite the wide use of biocompatible materials for IV catheters, intraluminal thrombotic catheter occlusions remain the number one cause of catheter dysfunction. Thrombotic occlusions are preventable and it is important focus because this type of occlusion is correlated to higher central line associated bloodstream infection rates. One of the earliest studies that identified this link was the TIMSIT study published in CHEST in 1998. A review of ICU patients showed that when thrombus was present, there was a 3.2 times higher rate of septicemia as well. Here is a quote by Henry Ford that I often think about, quote unquote, most people spend more time and energy going around problems than in trying to solve them. And isn't that so true? Most would prefer to just order out the place than to try to identify the real cause. We have talked about why our team wanted to solve the preventable problem of central venous access device occlusions and why we thought it was an important initiative. Next, we will spend some time discussing the process we underwent. As a reminder, our goal at Hartford Hospital was to develop a catheter patency bundle that would reduce the waste, variability, and defects of central venous access device occlusions. In order to validate our approach, we utilized a Six Sigma process known as DMAIC, define, measure, analyze, improve, and control. The first step to this process was to define our goals, objectives, and desired outcomes. In order to define our goals, we wanted to gain full stakeholder alignment between IV therapy, nurse leadership, infection control, pharmacy, materials management, as well as members of the value analysis team. From that, we came away with a consensus for our focus related to central venous access device occlusion management. In order to better understand the current state, we reviewed both the insertion and maintenance of both our peripherally and centrally inserted central venous access devices. We reviewed the five Ps, otherwise known as our IV processes, protocols, practices, products, and patient outcomes. This included things like, for example, how and when was Alteplace ordered? Who can order it? How is it being administered? Why were we using heparin? We also looked at the catheters, the tubing, needleless connectors, kits, and supplies to determine what were the current technologies being used today and whether there was newer technology that would help. We identified inpatient acute areas where these procedures were happening and who was involved from both the physician and nursing side. We determined that our desired outcomes were reducing the unnecessary overuse of pharmacy treatments and supplies. We felt this would lead to better patient outcomes and provide improved nurse efficiency as well. Once we had set our goals, objectives, and key measures in the defined phase, three key questions quickly surfaced. When is Alteplace appropriate and who is currently using it only when it is deemed appropriate? In other words, when should Alteplace be used and when should it not be used? What is our current process for ordering and administering Alteplace? How could we prevent these complications instead of constantly treating them?
At this point in the process, we had more questions than answers. It became important that we better understood the data. The second step in the DMAIC process was to measure current performance. This meant we needed to obtain baseline metrics from which our success was measured. We obtained the Alteplase consumption from our pharmacy. We looked at our pre-filled heparin flushing syringe consumption. The IV team began receiving a daily out-to-place consumption report from pharmacy. We worked with the Central Line Associated Bloodstream Infection Committee and reviewed a historical tracking of our Central Line bloodstream infections since 2007. With that, we also collected Central Line days dating back to 2007 as well. Lastly, we reviewed our needleless connector consumption. We used 2014 as the retrospective baseline for performance improvement for all measures. Let's take a look at what we found. Do you know how much Alteplase your facility is using to clear occluded catheters? Alteplase works by dissolving the fibrin that forms intraluminal in catheters as a result of blood reflux. Better known, Alteplase is also used for patients who have had an active stroke related to blood clots. Its usage is an indicator of occlusions, which cause unnecessary costs and complications such as a two-hour or more delay in treatment, increased costs to treat, and it places the patient at an increased risk of a bloodstream infection, which carries with it a high mortality rate of 12 to 25%. Using 2014 as the baseline year, Hartford Hospital was using 1,440 milligrams of Alteplase per year or 119 milligrams per month, roughly four milligrams per day, even though we were hep locking our lines. At Hartford Hospital, the pharmacy aliquots Alteplase into one milligram syringes to use for declotting central venous access devices. At times, they will open a brand new 50 milligram vial and pull up 51 milligram syringes and freeze for later usage. At other times, they use what may be left over from a stroke patient as using Alteplase on a stroke patient is weight-based. For example, a patient who requires 43 milligrams for a stroke protocol based off of their weight the other 7 milligrams is frozen in 1 cc syringes. The cost per 1 milligram vial is approximately $65. By using 1,440 doses times 65, we were spending $93,600 per year on Alteplase. This was a surprise to me. Realizing this, my team and I felt that there was room for improvement, but not realizing to what extent. In addition, we used around 52,500 heparin flushes per year with an associated cost of approximately $60,000. Finally, we spent a little over $100,000 per year on needleless connectors for central lines, using around 110,500 eaches per year. Based on this data, we had plenty of room for improvement. Over the last few decades, the risks of Alteplase have been well established in multiple publications. Alteplase has been linked to bloodstream infections, and yet we do not use it sparingly and had trained staff to use it at the first sign of a sluggish catheter. Even after its initial use, a second dose may be required to further declot the catheter. In fact, approximately 10% of PICC lines still need to be replaced after a second dose of Alteplase. In addition to delays in therapy, a study conducted at Boston Medical Center by author Thakarar showed results of 3,723 PICC patients linked to central line associated bloodstream infections. In this study, occlusion occurred in 28% of the patients five days prior to central line associated bloodstream infection identification. Further evidence showed that occluded catheters requiring alteplase 
have a three and a half, and a half times more likely occurrence of a central line associated bloodstream infection. As vascular access nurses, let's all ask ourselves this question. Are we doing everything we can in our institutions to prevent the overuse of Alteplase given its potential to cause a clapsy? As Florence Nightingale said, quote unquote, the very first requirement in a hospital is that it should do the sick no harm. Once we had defined and measured the problem, we needed to analyze the situation to determine the root cause of where our failures and processes were happening. The third step used in our DMAIC process was to analyze concurrent performance. We analyzed the collected data in our current process for managing occluded catheters and determine the areas of improvement. As a reminder from the defined phase, we looked at the five P's, processes, protocols, practices, products, and patient outcomes. This helped us differentiate between value-added and non-value-added actions. We conducted a review of best practices and published research available at the time. We understood from this analysis that there were different types of occlusions and that we had been overusing Alteplase. Our decentralized ordering of Alteplase by ICU registered nurses without first identifying the occlusion became evident. We looked at newer technologies that could reduce the blood reflux in catheters that cause occlusions. We looked at the INS standards and other evidence we determined that we needed to have multiple interventions to address the problems that existed and that we needed to prioritize those opportunities to improve. But first, what was causing those pesky alarms and why weren't our current troubleshooting addressing it? Imagine the patient perspective. Quote unquote, so you just got your patient to sleep? Let me play you a song of my people. Pump alarms. Have you ever heard of a patient who slept well during constant occlusion pump alarms? Beep beep. Everything looks okay. Tubing's not kinked. So why does it keep beeping? The truth is we cannot see the tip of the catheter to know. Unless we are Superman. If we had Superman powers like this caped hero, would we be able to see what was going on at the tip of the catheter? Still, probably not. If 42% of catheter occlusions are non-thrombotic and could not be treated with Alteplase, we had to have a way to differentiate these occlusions. We looked at the various identifiers for each type of occlusion and began to map out the troubleshooting process that would delineate these causes. Since we cannot see the tip of the catheter and often do not have radiographic imaging, we needed to really think about all of the factors that needed to be studied and more importantly, develop an inclusion slash exclusion criteria for the use of Alteplase. I would like all of you to think for a moment about whether bedside nurses in your facilities are properly assessing catheters that are occluded. Does critical thinking occur before administering Alteplase? Given its risks, we wanted to lower its use at our facility. During the analyze phase, we began asking some questions about optimizing the IV's team's role in managing Alteplase. We started with the premise of whether IV expertise was needed. We looked at all of the factors that must be considered and how well-trained the individuals need to be to understand this. The troubleshooting and assessment phase and the management and centralization of the ordering and administration of Alteplase became the basis for eventually developing our standard work process. The policies and procedures had to have an algorithmic decision-making to them to ensure that things like checking for central venous access device necessity and troubleshooting for obstruction were considered. We knew that IV team and standard nursing would need to have a great deal of education around this area and that became evident. 
Lastly, there would need to be an auditing process to ensure that the process that was developed was followed. During the analyze phase, we reviewed the research on needleless connectors because we knew that the performance of these devices varied. This study, conducted in 2011 by Hathaway, highlighted what we had learned. There was a very big gap in understanding around the proper ways to flush and clamp needleless connectors, and that if done incorrectly, it could be a cause of the blood reflux that initiated the clotting process. In 2014, we were using a needleless connector marketed as negative. In our practice review, we identified the gaps in practice around the use of this connector. Today, there is a study that reflects what we found to be true. There are differences in the ways needleless connectors perform. This study that was published in the 2009 Journal of Infusion Nursing by Jasinski demonstrated that occlusions could be reduced using an anti-reflux connector. In this study, Jasinski demonstrated that by switching from a negative, negative needleless connector, their Ohio Health Hospital showed decreased occlusions and elimination of heparin. They also decreased IV supply costs. These outcomes were aligned to our goals as well. Later, we found out why the anti-reflux connectors had better results. In 2017, a study was published in the Journal for Vascular Access by Hall, comparing the amount of blood reflux that occurs upon connection or disconnection of syringe comparing 14 needleless connectors. This chart from left to right on your screen shows a comparison of blood reflux for the various types of connectors. Starting from the left, negative displacement devices, like we were using, were first generation devices. They have the highest blood reflux upon disconnection of the syringe. Positive displacement have reflux, but upon syringe connection. Neutral devices were an improvement on previous generations of connectors, but still have reflux upon syringe disconnection. In short, we learned early on that the design of the connector has a significant impact on the ability to clear blood and control reflux. This study method used an in vitro venous pressure model replicating the peripheral venous pressure found in human vasculature to replicate the conditions that cause blood reflux into an IV catheter during connection of a syringe from each needleless connector. For reference, it takes 10 microliters of blood to fill a 20 gauge peripheral catheter. There are significant differences in reflux volumes for fluid displacement among needleless connectors. Pressure activated anti reflux devices have the least amount of blood reflux based on these study results. The fourth step of our DMAIC process was to improve current performance. The goal of our improvements was to reduce the waste, variability, and defects that we had identified during the review of our five Ps. We determined that all non-tunneled central venous access catheters should be assessed by a skilled RN for thrombotic occlusions before out the place is ordered. There was a patency algorithm that I will share with you that we utilized to troubleshoot the occluded catheters. Another improvement was that the IVRN should receive the order and then determine next steps. We believe that centralization of this process to the RN team was critical. If trial results fared as expected, the goal was to eliminate the heparin flushes and implement the anti-reflux needleless connector. We conducted a trial to test the interventions we believed would have an impact on our goals. The anti-reflux technology was used in our five ICUs during a three-month trial. Over that period, there was no clamping sequence taught, no heplock flushing, and an overall reduction in alteplase usage. 
We were receiving the daily reports of out-to-place usage from the pharmacy during this period. Per the policy, we began centralizing the ordering process to the IV team and collected data. In addition, we began testing our algorithm to validate the troubleshooting for central venous access device patency. As mentioned earlier, we developed an acute non-tunneled central venous catheter patency assessment algorithm. To start, we needed to determine if the central venous catheter was indicated. This required a little bit of a pre-assessment looking at the patient's electronic medical record. If no indication was found, then we moved to the next step where we assessed the patient's peripheral veins for peripheral IV placement while also having a discussion with the registered nurse. We then contact the medical doctor to get an order to remove the line. If the medical do doctor discontinues the central venous catheter, we stop and insert a peripheral IV only if needed. I'm sitting here with Heather Hatch, clinical nurse leader of IV therapy services. And Heather right now is just received an order to evaluate a, a double lumen pick line for a sluggish blood return out of the red lumen. So, Heather, how are you? Good. Good. So tell the audience, what is the first thing that you did when you got an order to, received regarding this catheter? So the first thing I did was a, a pre-assessment of what was going on with the patient. I wanted to determine the need. Uh, this patient, in fact, needs the line. She's on multiple medications. Um, receiving chemotherapy, antibiotics, uh, blood products. Uh, so there is definite need for the line to stay in place. Okay, so great. If the doctor says, no, I will not remove the central line, we ask him for the reason for not removing and document, and then we report that to upper administration so that they understand that a doctor is refusing to remove a central venous catheter that is no longer indicated. If the central venous catheter line was necessary, then we needed to assess the central venous catheter for mechanical obstruction, looking for kinks or pinched catheter lumen. After this was checked, we then tried to see if we can restore blood flow. If it, blood flow is restored, we stop and then document our interventions. If the blood flow is not restored, then we check for a thrombotic occlusion. So how did you know what you were supposed to do in regards to uh, the steps that you take when you get a patient with an occluded catheter? So we've created an algorithm uh, to help the staff uh, follow along um, as far part of, part of our protocol to determine whether or not uh, we can uh, to, uh, find out the cause of uh, the problem with the, the line. Right. First thing we look at is the line necessity because we may not have to do much more probing. You know, maybe the line just needs to come out actually. Um, in this case, like I said, we do need the line. The next step would be to determine uh, what type, well, what type of line is actually part of the pre-assessment. Also looking to see if any x-rays had been performed uh, and how long ago. Okay. If, this patient did have a chest x-ray from what I understand. Correct. And how long ago? So that was on September 26th um, and it is now the 2nd, so six days ago. Um, so anything could have happened at this point in time if the line truly is um, not working properly. That line could have migrated, it could have gone contralateral, it could have gone up the IJ, maybe it's kinked. Um, so we would want to make sure that uh, in doing our assessment that we do take that into consideration and possibly order another chest x-ray. Okay, and what did you see on the chest x-ray from the 26th? So the chest x-ray from the 26th does show that the catheter is uh, potentially a little a little short. Uh, assuming right here is the atrial appendage, we would like to keep that about two centimeters below, which would be considered the caboatrial junction, which is the optimal location for, pick tip lo for the pick tip. Um, this appears to be a little bit short. 
Okay. So yeah. what what is would be the next steps that you would take, considering that this catheter is a little bit on the shorter side? And, and knowing that we need the patient, I, I need the catheter. Correct. I would I would want to look at the patient. I always I always like to take a look at the patient to see what's going on, um, to rule out any other issues. I also want to see if in fact the catheter is not functioning properly. Um, there have been times that I've gone into a room and, and suddenly the catheter works beautiful. Great. Um, at that point in time, I would probably not do any other intervention. Um, knowing that it is short, I will take that into consideration. If we're still having issues with the line, we may want to consider replacing the line, being that it is a little short um, because of the risk of developing thrombus and potential for infection. We want to make sure that, that the line that we're using is properly placed because it could... Um, get rid of the potential of having the, the um, patency issues. Correct. Knowing full well that uh, a chest x-ray is a dynamic one view, mm -hmm. would we think about redoing another chest x-ray? Yeah, that's a good point. We actually could do a two view, excuse me, a two view x-ray, uh, which could give us a, a clearer picture. Um, but again, we always need, we need to take into consideration that the x-ray, you know, there could be a slight variation based on patient position. Uh, you know, I, I can see here that her arms are down, so that leads me to believe, uh, that's a little concerning, because with her arms down, the, that would typically show that or the pic would migrate inward. So if her arms are down and they're taking the picture, it's probably even shorter than it appears right now. Great. Thanks, Heather. Let's, let's now go see the patient and assess that catheter. Right. Was it a partial or complete thrombotic occlusion? Either or, we look then for a recent chest x-ray, looking to see if one has been done within the last four days. If yes, we reviewed the chest x-ray to see if the pick line could be retracted one to two centimeters to see if there was any pinching going on in the vasculature or if it was just a little bit too deep in the right atrium. If there was no chest x-ray, then we would order one. Once we get the results, we review those to see if the central venous catheter was able to be retracted that one to two centimeters. If it could, we would remove the dressing and retract the central venous catheter while applying negative pressure with an empty 10 cc syringe to see if blood flow would be restored. Thanks. So uh, we're back and it, we're now at the bedside um, with the patient and I'm obviously going to keep the patient's uh, privacy protected during this uh, video recording. So Heather, yes. you have determined that, how much was, when you, that, that pick line was placed, how far out was it? So when this pick line was originally placed, it was out to zero, which okay. it looks like the dressing looks beautiful. Um, it was recently changed. Pick line doesn't look like it's migra migrated out here. Okay. Excuse me. Um, so it, it doesn't look like the catheters come out at all. Okay. What I'd like to do is try to flush both lumens. Okay. Let's 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 do that now. What type of flushing technique are you going to utilize? So what I'd like to use is a pulsatile flushing technique to create a little bit of turbulence and then a little 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 tough here. Yeah, I see it rebounding a little yeah, bit. Yeah, a little bit. So no blood return. And unfortunately, patient's having a little bit of t difficulty with mobility, yeah. so I don't really want to be pushing, pushing her arm out too much. So not too much repositioning, but yeah, definitely, definitely snug, definitely okay. tight. Okay. If it was not to be restored, or if we could not retract the pick line one to two centimeters, and the pick line was too short, we had to then ask ourselves: Should the central venous catheter be replaced? And if the central venous catheter needed to be replaced, we have the discussion with the MD to obtain an order to replace it. If the catheter was retracted one to two centimeters and still no blood was restored, then we order out the place. So I'd like to also assess the purple lumen as well. Oh, okay. Um, to see if, if maybe we're having difficulties on both sides. I did pause the pump. And if you were having difficulties with both lumens, what would you suspect? If I'm, I would suspect that it's placement. It's okay. related to placement. You having any difficulty with that this one? This one's a little snug once again. A little, little blood return, but okay. definitely a lot smoother than the other one. Okay, so you're not getting that rebound. No rebound. So no. as well. 
I might push on her arm because she does have difficulty with mobility. Mm -hmm. I might see if maybe just a little bit of pressure makes a difference. Makes huh? a difference. Still Actually. the same concept. Yeah, it's still a little, little tight. Okay. You know, it is flushing, but again, not, not the way it should. Now, with the repositioning, are you getting any rebound with that uh, syringe plunger? A little bit of rebound still okay. with the plunger. Right. It is a little smoother, but not, not significant. Now, seeing that this catheter was short on a chest X-ray, correct? We really can't retract, can we? We really can't. Um, you know, that would just, you know, it might alleviate the problem temporarily, but ultimately, it is not really the safe thing to do. So, what does that put us in a position? What can we do further? Um, We've if already we, established the need, so we may want to consider uh, doing an exchange procedure. Mm -hmm. um, we do have blood return in one of the lumens. Uh, I believe the catheter is, for the most part, paint, and I think it's more maybe getting caught, maybe it's bent in, in the tissues. It should probably be a little bit longer. If it was in the cavoatial junction, there would be proper movement to help prevent um, any issues. Great. So, Great. That, well, then. that would be my recommendation. Great, and you'll document all that and talk to the and nurse and the doctor. And I will talk to the provider and the bedside nurse as well. Awesome. Correct. Thank you, Heather. That was a uh, that was great. Appreciate it. No problem. And thank you, patient. If the catheter did not need to be replaced and was in an optimal tip position, then we would then proceed to order Alteplase. In 2018, the results of our process and improvements were published in the Journal of Vascular Access. Our results showed a 69% decrease in occlusions, a 36% decrease in central line associated bloodstream infections, a 41% decrease in needleless connector consumption, a 38% decrease in IV supplies, and 100,000 plus in savings. We have found that focusing on improvement in IV therapy has its rewards. We have received two rewards in the last few years. The first award was for our work in reducing alteplase for catheter clearance, and our second was for our work on peripheral IV placement using a bundled approach. We were very proud to receive the first award, but also to be recognized for the work we do around our central venous access device occlusion management. We addressed the problem of catheter occlusion straight on. We implemented a solution that helped improve the problem, and we have sustained the improvement since 2015. We had an initial reduction of alteplase of 69% and we further reduced that by centralizing the management of alteplase use, creating an algorithm, use of anti-reflux connector, and training on proper flushing technique. Our initial savings were 100,000, but we have avoided another 500,000 in supply waste since 2016. I'm proud of the IV team at Hartford Hospital who all work hard to improve IV care every single day. Hello, I'm Hartford HealthCare's Tina Verona. Today we are celebrating, it's an exciting day here at Hartford Hospital. We are celebrating the teams of the year, clinical team and the support team here at Hartford Hospital. And we are with the winners of, this is the um, IV therapy services team who won um, for clinical team of the year. It's a mighty team. In the past, we needed to improve our practices around central venous access device occlusions. At present, we are continuing to sustain those results. The fifth and final step to our DMAIC process was to control current performance. For five years now, we have sustained the results from our original work. We completed the initial improvements in 2015. From then to present, we have continued to use the algorithm process, centralized management, reporting, and use of the anti-reflux connector to sustain these results. We are continuing to work to reduce the out place even further through better training on flushing. 
This motion graphic bar chart shows five years of monthly consumption for our needleless connector usage with our central venous access devices. In 2014, we were averaging 9,200 needleless connectors per month, or about 110,000 per year. By 2015, we had dramatically improved and reduced usage by 41% to 5,450 needleless connectors per month. In 2016 to 2019, we have sustained this lower number of connectors used. These improvements through present have saved around 66,100 connectors per year, or nearly 330,500 connectors since 2015. As mentioned earlier, at Hartford Hospital, we aliquot and utilize one milligram doses of Alteplase. This motion graphic bar chart shows five years of monthly consumption. In 2014, we were averaging 119 doses per month. By 2015, we had dramatically improved and reduced usage by 69% to 53.2 doses per month. In 2016, we used 47.5 doses per month. In 2017, 45.6 doses per month. In 2018, 36.2 doses per month. And we have sustained these improvements through present, averaging right around 40 doses or 40 milligrams per month. This motion graphic bar chart shows five years of annualized Alteplase consumption. In 2014, we used 1,428 doses. By 2015, we had dramatically improved and reduced usage by 69% to 638.4 doses. In 2016, we used 570 doses per year. In 2017, 547.2 doses per year. In 2018, 434.4 doses per year. And we have sustained these results through present where we are using just under 500 doses or 500 milligrams per year. This motion graphic bar chart shows five years of annualized out-to-place costs. In 2014, we spent 92,820 on central venous access device occlusions. By 2015, we had dramatically improved and reduced our costs to $41,496. In 2016, we spent $37,050. In 2017, we spent $35,568. In 2018, we spent $28,236. And we have sustained these results through present, avoiding the unnecessary cost of central venous access device occlusions. Based on our study results, we believe that we have avoided central line associated bloodstream infections, costs, and delays in treatment. These are factors that extend hospital length of stay and add a significant burden to the healthcare system. Our improvements worked, but we don't want to stop there. By showing how we can sustain improvements in IV care, we have gained support to keep growing our team. In 2015, we had seven people on the IV team. Today, I am so proud to announce that we are up to 23 IV personnel. And it is important to note that we are not adding FTEs to the overall nursing budget, but rather reallocating staff or an hours to IV therapy specialist hours to gain headcount in our team, knowing we are saving nursing time, troubleshooting, central line venous access device occlusions, and with our recent centralization of peripheral IVs to the IV team, we are saving nursing time in the replacement of peripheral intravenous catheters. In other words, we are shaving time off RN budgets and reallocating to IV therapy to reflect our needs. We are very proud to be able to increase headcount at a time when many hospitals are finding ways to cut the IV team. This team's focus on efficiency in lean care has helped avoid at least 
$500,000 in overspend for areas that do not add value to the patient or treatment, i.e. out to place use and excessive supply costs. Our team and recognition have grown as a result of leading improvements in IV therapy. We have established a clear process and sustained that for over five years. Central venous access device occlusions are a preventable problem. We are continuously working on reducing our out to place use even further, looking at flushing practices to continuously prove. There are three things we know we can do better on. Next, we will publish these five year results very soon. The manuscript is in the works. We have some ongoing central line associated bloodstream infection initiatives. Mostly, we believe that our flushing practices are still not optimal, despite all that we have done around training and education in this area. Finally, we are working on some new tools to better manage workflow and help further support the team. By showing how we can sustain improvements in IV care, we have gained support to keep growing our IV team, but our work is not complete. Our policy and process for when and how to use Alteplase when you have ruled out all other causes. Alteplase is a last intervention, should never be the first. It is important to keep blood out of catheters. We have found that the anti-reflux technology has helped. Overall, we've reduced occlusions, central line associated bloodstream infections, Alteplase slash heparin usage, IV supplies, overall costs, nurse time, and delays in treatment. We've increased patient and nurse satisfaction, our dwell times, blood sampling. We've taken ownership and centralized the management of Alteplase. Our VAV team has the responsibility. Our work is continuous. Considerations include reporting, tracking, education, and of course, training. Thank you for your time today. I am available anytime for questions, please feel free to email me at lee.steer at hhchealth.org or you can even call my cell phone at 860-614-8254.